Hey everybody, thanks for uh, taking the time to join us this morning, and uh, hopefully you can hear me better. Let me know in the comments if you will. Uh, if you can hear me better, I know it was a little quiet in our first video, our call to worship this morning. So for a couple of minutes here, we're just going to kind of uh, wait on people joining in here and uh, say hello if you will. Sometimes Facebook will tell me that you're, you're joining. I see at least one person is on now. Uh, say hello in the comments if you will, and, and let me know if you can hear me well, if you'll comment about that too. Um, I can try one other thing if this is still too quiet. Uh, but we'll just kind of test that here. We're going to wait a couple couple seconds here. All right. While people are logging in, I just want to also share a couple of announcements for us. And... Uh, First of all, I want to thank those who took the time to clean the church parking lot and get that uh, flown. I know it's still not uh, conditioned ready for us to be there quite yet because there's just so much snow and ice that we got. Uh, but I want to thank those who took the time to clean it for us and hope that you're all doing well and safe and warm in this, uh, this crazy winter weather week that we've had. For a couple of announcements that we have, we, uh, we have obviously canceled everything for today just out of precaution, but Lord willing, next week we're going to be back uh, with everything else that we normally plan. So next week we plan to have uh, prayer back, 9.45 a.m., plan to have Sunday school back at, at 10 o'clock, plan to have um, worship back at 11. We also have our church family meeting, uh, which is what I've been calling our church family business meeting. We got that uh, coming up next week as well, immediately following service uh, is still our plan. Uh, weather should be good. And then the workshop that we were supposed to have today, uh, that, we've, that we've canceled, that workshop that was going to be a lunch following service and then go through the workshop, that has been rescheduled for March 6th. March 6th. Uh, that'll give us enough time to uh, let people know. Good morning, Jean. I say it, you're say, see that uh, you're saying good morning on there. Um, so March 6th gives us time to get the word out uh, to let people know that we have rescheduled that and we also plan next Sunday night to start back like we originally planned with our Sunday evening Bible study start back on the 13th and then we're going to go uh, to um, the 20th and the 27th Lord willing and we'll wrap that up good morning uh, Mindy and Troy see if you guys are logging in there and so those are a couple of our announcements also wanted to let you know that on March 20th we got something special uh, we have planned to have a special speaker coming to share the message with us, and so looking forward to that. I still plan to, to be there that Sunday, but we have somebody coming to share with us as the plan, and I'll let you know more uh, more closer to time, but that'll be March 20th. And then I wanted to encourage you to be praying for our association. Our sister churches are banding together to go up to Montana. Our association has a partnership with churches up there, and near the end of April, they're going to be taking a small team up to help churches um, through doing some prayer walking, doing some light construction work, and also doing uh, some outreach to the community. So just keep them in your prayers as you remember that. Um, all these announcements should be in the description of this video. If, uh, if you've jumped on a little bit later, they should be in print there for you to be able to go back and see them. Uh, good morning, Barb and Phillips. So you guys are joining. Good morning, uh, Mary. Glad to have you all joining us. Uh, this morning, we're going to dive in in just a minute to our message. I've just been making announcements and uh, getting started. If you can hear me well, uh, I'm assuming you can, uh, but if, if this is not loud enough, let me know and I can see if I can make one more adjustment on the volume. Uh, one other thing I just want to take note of, if you go to the Facebook page, if you haven't already, I mean, you're watching this, but you can find the sermon notes if you were able to get those or if you'd want those or want to go back later on and print those off. This morning, though, we're going to begin to open up the Word and continue in the series that we have been in. So the last several weeks we have been, this is actually the sixth week, that we are in this Foundations series. We're looking at foundational uh, points that are so important for us to understand as we are going to be seeking to lay the foundations uh, of looking at our, our bylaws and, and looking toward the future, preparing for uh, the next pastor that the Lord is sending to you. We're going back to the foundations. We're going back to the basic things to remind ourselves what God's Word says. And a couple weeks ago, we, we kind of started this sub-series. 
Um, so we're looking at foundational truths, and we're using that acrostic Baptist to talk about major doctrines. And a couple weeks ago, we really began zeroing in on what is the local church. And a couple weeks ago, we laid the foundation how there are local churches throughout the New Testament. Local church membership is not a, a, an idea that people have come up with. It's something that we see in the Bible, we see from the Scriptures. And then last week, we kind of saw part one of a message that, that we're dividing into two parts. Last week we saw the first part of this series we're going to keep diving into today of what does the Bible say about church? And so we're highlighting just a couple of myths of what the world has said about church, what, um, what some churches have gotten off track looking at. We're going to look at just a couple of those myths. We looked at one last week which had to do with children's and youth ministry. We, we looked at history and most importantly we looked at scripture to see that God has designed such an important place for parents and grandparents to impact and disciple the next generation. And so it's not wrong to reach out and have Sunday schools and VBS. Those are all great things to do. But we saw the lesson from history that, that we cannot replace parents and grandparents. God has designed for parents and grandparents to play a critical role and have responsibility in such an important way in the discipleship of the next generation. And so as we seek to relaunch and revamp your children's and youth ministries before, uh, before you call your next pastor, it's so important for us to see what does God say about this and what biblical principles has he instructed us to be focused on and, and to keep as the main thing. We saw that last week, and this week we're going to dive into two other myths, and then we're really going to dive into something that we haven't really dug into too much yet, and that is... What is discipleship? What, what is the Great Commission really about? So we're going to dive into three things this morning. We're going to ask the question, does worship style really matter? We're going to ask the question, is the social gospel valid? And we're going to ask the question, what is discipleship? Now these three may appear to be unrelated, but they actually are connected in many ways. And the first two, again, are some myths that sometimes are thrown out there as this is what we need to do to, to grow a church to reach more people. As you've heard me say several times, and I'm sure I'm going to say it many more times in my time with you, church health is more important than church growth. It is a great thing to have a passion to reach people. There's nothing wrong with that. But we want to know what the Bible says, what the Lord says to us about particular questions. When there is something thrown out there that this is the way to reach people. We want to go back to the Bible and say, okay, does this thing that I'm hearing, does it line up with what the Bible says? The Word of God is the standard. It is the authority for everything that we believe. And so we are going to dive into understanding this first myth in just a moment. Once again, church health, honoring Christ, being about His priorities and what the Lord has called us to Church health is more important than church growth. In the book of Acts, when the church was focused on Christ, the Lord added to them those being saved. The Lord was saving people, bringing them in. The Lord will take care of that. Our role is to be focused on serving Jesus. Faithfulness is more important than success. Rather than being focused on building the little kingdom of Lebanon Baptist Church, we are focused on building the kingdom of God. And so when we're about the Great Commission, when we're about what Jesus has called us to do, you may reach someone with the gospel at your workplace. You may reach someone in your community. You may reach a family member with the gospel, and they may not come to Lebanon Baptist Church. But guess what? We're about the kingdom of God. We're not about the little kingdom. We rejoice when God brings people into our fellowship, but we recognize it's about a bigger purpose, building the kingdom of God. So what happens when churches focus on growth and their own ingenuity, their own strength, and their own wisdom for doing church rather than focusing on what God has called us to? Well, in the Bible, we see this in just a, well, many, many places, but I'm going to highlight just several this morning, just a few. When churches focus on their own growth, they focus on their own methods, their own wisdom, their own strength of doing things, rather than seeking Christ, rather than seeking what God has revealed in His Word to be their priorities, things don't go as the Lord intended. For example, one example is the church in Corinth. Now, we spent a lot of time last year looking at about half of that letter together, the Corinthian church. Corinth was a church 
that had become ensnared by the temptations of the culture around them, and they reverted to worldly living, and they cheapened the grace of Christ. They lived however they wanted, rather than living honoring the Lord. And Paul wrote to them, telling them that if you're going to honor Christ, you need to exercise some church discipline. You need to be testing these false teachings that you're hearing. Turning to the methods of the world got Corinth in a lot of trouble. There was the church in Ephesus, which is one of the seven churches that Jesus writes letters to, specific churches, in Revelation chapters 2 through 3. And to summarize, what happened in Ephesus is Ephesus was a church that Jesus begins off praising them. They've held to the truth. They are doing the things that are right in so many respects. They've tested. They have, uh, they have tested false prophets, and they have found them to be false. The church in Ephesus had had Paul and Timothy, and tradition tells us the Apostle John as well. All three of these key leaders in the first century had served as pastors in this church in Ephesus. And yet Jesus said, while you're doing all these things great, you have forgotten your first love. Forgotten your first love. He said, repent, or I will remove your lampstand. Now, what does this mean? We don't have lampstands today. Uh, we don't put a lamp on the middle of this uh, pole in order to get light in a room. If anybody has a lampstand, though, bring it to church sometime. I, I'd love to, to be able to show that to everybody as an actual uh, teaching prop of, of what this was. But when Jesus says, repent or I'll remove your lampstand to the church in Ephesus, what he was saying is what he had said back in the Gospels. We as believers are called to be the light of the world. And when we get our eyes off of Christ, there is the danger of our light, our witness being diminished. The light being covered and our witness not going out to the world, but rather being removed. We see in the church of Ephesus a solemn lesson that when the church body gets off track, we are in danger of losing our witness that the Spirit does through us as a corporate body. Unless we make that U-turn, we repent. We return and turn back to Christ. We also see in the letters to the seven churches, the church of Sardis. I'll just highlight one more church. The church of Sardis, it says in Revelation, was a church that had the reputation of being alive, but were spiritually dead. Stuff was happening at the first church of Sardis. They had a full calendar of events, I imagine, a program for everything, great music, great facilities, lots of opportunities, but Jesus said they were spiritually dead. Are we focused on being healthy as God intends or focused on doing the mission in our own way? Unfortunately, these temptations are not new. They've been around since the very beginning of the church. So this week we're going to highlight two myths and then really dive into discipleship. Last week I gave you that, that handout, Sola Scriptura, which was not exhaustive, uh, but it had just different topics listed and then it had scripture passages. Not every passage in the Bible, but it had scripture passages to get us started on what does the Bible say about this ministry or this aspect of church life. And so we, we had that handed out last week. And we saw in there that there's a biblical basis for so many things that we do. There's a basis for how we take up an offering. There's a biblical basis for even having a, a pulpit. You find back in Nehemiah chapter 8 that there was a pulpit built and a, and a platform built in order for the word of God to be held on that lectern and be taught to the people. There's a biblical basis for so many things we do as the church. And our forefathers even said, this is not scripture, but to show you the thought and the intention that went behind even something that may seem so insignificant as having a pulpit in a church. Our forefathers in Protestant churches even designed churches with the idea of where the word of God would be. They placed the pulpit in the middle of the, the platform intentionally, and they built big pulpits in many historic churches. Because you can read some of the stuff that, that famous preachers of the past used to say. They said, we need, we need a pulpit you can barely see the guy over, barely see his head poking above it, because this is the sacred desk that holds the Word of God. All that guy is really doing is proclaiming and teaching the Bible to the church. They understood that it was the Word of God which nourishes us 
as believers that the church needs the Bible. And they took that understanding from seeing what happened in Nehemiah chapter 8, where the first pulpit was made, and the whole purpose of it was to have something on which the Bible could rest. Now, the biggest Bible I own is this one. It's a study Bible, and it's pretty heavy. And if I was to hold this on a Sunday morning, my arm would probably get tired after a while. Back in those days when Bibles were hand-copied before the printing press, they were huge. Maybe you've seen some of these uh, historic family Bibles. Maybe your family has one. These things were massive. They were two or three times the size of the Bible I just held up. And so it took that big desk, that big sturdy podium, that pulpit, to hold the Word of God and to be shared then with the people. And that's just one example of how the Bible gives us a basis for so many things that we do as the church. But let's dive into our first myth this morning. We're going to understand some history, and we're going to understand what God's Word says about it. Rather than approaching it from our opinion or our perception, we want to go back to the Bible. So here's the myth. The first myth we're looking at this morning, change the worship style, grow the church. This was a really big thing that was predominant in the revival culture um, of the past in the U.S. and the U.K., um, what would happen back then is revivalists would be having their tent meetings or their street meetings, and what songwriters and hymn writers back then would do is they would copy the, the style of music that was in the bars. They would go out to the street corner whenever they'd have their tent set up or they'd be on a street corner and they'd be playing music, and they would copy the bar tunes. So people that were out on the streets, uh, out for, for other reasons having a night on the town, would hear this music, they would come and be drawn to, to listen to more. They thought it was the, the bar music. But then they would get closer and they would hear that Christian lyrics had been put to the bar music. And then the gospel would be shared in a message following it. That's what happened in revival culture. Kind of how this idea and this myth developed was if we use music, we can draw a crowd in. What happened in the church growth movement of the 70s, the 80s, the 90s, probably some of the early 2000s as well, is the worship wars began. The idea that if we're really going to reach people, we have to change the style of music. We have to be more contemporary or more this or more that in order to draw people in. This was a myth that was used, however, and it was not really what was most important. Let's seek to understand from the Bible what God says about worship and worship style. It's not just a tool in our arsenal. There is an intention in the scriptures behind worship and what its purpose is. First of all, in First Corinthians, uh, First Chronicles, pardon me, chapter fifteen, verse sixteen, the Word of God says this: Then David spoke to the leaders of the Levites to appoint their brethren to be singers, accompanied by instruments of music, with string instruments, harps, and cymbals, raising the voice with resounding joy. We see that David did appoint worship leaders. The idea of being led in worship, having a worship leader or a team of worship leaders, is biblical. That comes straight out of the Bible. The basis of being led and those being called and gifted to lead the church body in worship is something we find straight out of the Bible. The thing is, however, most of the time in the New Testament and in the Old Testament, most of the time when we see there being worship being done and singing being done, it's usually congregational worship, meaning that those who were leading worship were leading the church body to sing. It was it was not about the instrumentality above the voices of the people, but it was about leading the people in singing to the Lord. Now there was, at times, the believers' worship. Believers coming together and praising the Lord and singing to Him. There were, at times, that the believers' worship ministered to the soul of somebody else who was not singing. Take, for example, David. David was a musician in sing, uh, King Call, Saul's court, pardon me, getting tongue-tied there, in King Saul's court, singing and, and leading worship for him, and the evil spirit would depart from Saul. Take Elijah, for example, in 2 Kings chapter 3, verses 14 and 15, the role that worship played here for Elisha as he was seeking the Lord. 2 Kings 3, verses 14 through 15, And Elisha said, As the Lord of hosts lives before whom I stand, surely were it not that I regarded the presence of Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, I would not look at you nor see you. But now bring me a musician. Then it happened when the musician played that the hand of the Lord came upon him. 
Elijah asked for a musician to come and to play to help him to seek the Lord. Worship music and, and, and worship time is important because it helps us to prepare our hearts seeking the Lord. In the Psalms, it tells us to enter the, the gates of the Lord with thanksgiving and with praise. The Lord has established worship for a reason. It prepares the soil of our heart. It helps us to seek the Lord. And there is a basis to be led and to minister to one another in this way. Believers, even in their worship, are partnering with the Lord in spiritual battle. There is an amazing story in 2 Chronicles chapter 20, verses 17 through 24, that says this. Notice what happens in this story. Because of worship, and this was a literal battle, but it points to the importance of spiritual battle the Lord does on our behalf as we focus on Him and we worship Him. 2 Chronicles chapter 20, 17 through 24. You will not need to fight in this battle. Position yourselves, stand still, and see the salvation of the Lord who is with you, O Jerusalem and Judah. Do not fear or be dismayed. Tomorrow go out against them, for the Lord is with you. And Jehoshaphat bowed his head with his face to the ground, and all Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem bowed before the Lord, worshiping the Lord. Then the Levites of the children of the Kohathites and of the children of the Korites stood up to praise the Lord God of Israel with voices loud and high. So they rose early in the morning and went out into the wilderness of Tekoa. And as they went out, Jehoshaphat stood and said, Hear me, O Judah, and you inhabitants of Jerusalem. Believe in the Lord your God, and you shall be established. Believe his prophets, and you shall prosper. And when he had consulted with the people, he appointed those who should sing. He appoints worship leaders to the Lord and those who should praise the beauty of his holiness. As they went out before the army, they were saying, Praise the Lord, for his mercy endures forever. Now when they had begun to sing and to praise, the Lord set ambushes against the people of Amnon and Moab and Mount Seir, who had come against Judah, and they were defeated. For the people of Amnon and Moab stood up against the inhabitants of Mount Seir to utterly kill and destroy them. And when they had made an end to the inhabitants of Seir, they helped to destroy one another. So when Judah came to the place overlooking the wilderness and looked toward the multitude, and there were their dead bodies fallen on the earth. No one had escaped. The Lord had told them, Stand still and see my salvation. I'm going to deliver you. The people, all they did in this instance, the fighting men went out, but worship leaders went before them. And they praised the Lord, and God do worship on, our, on their behalf. There is spiritual warfare that God does, and our partnership with Him, our, our following of the Lord, does not always require us to do something. Now, sometimes, yes, but sometimes all the Lord calls us to do is to praise Him and to let Him fight the battle on our behalf. We see that worship leadership and spiritual warfare, even in worship, is biblical, and it's an invaluable ministry. But is style really the magic key? Let's turn our attention to that point of the myth today. Is style really what matters so much in worship? The Psalms speak, for example, of being still and knowing that the Lord is God. So there is a basis for contemplation, uh, contemplative, quiet worship. But the Psalms also speak of getting out all the instruments and making a loud, joyful noise to the Lord. So we see a basis as well for an instrumental worship band. That is also something we see that is biblical. But did you know that our Lord Jesus talked about how important hymns were through what he actually did? In Matthew chapter 26 and verse 30, right after Jesus establishes the Lord's Supper, he, he establishes communion, he tells the disciples, do this in remembrance of me, this is my blood, this is my body, do this in remembrance of me. Then the Bible says this, And when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. Jesus and his disciples, right after taking of the Lord's Supper, they sang a hymn, and then they went out to the Mount of Olives, which was then where the Garden of Gethsemane was, and he was laboring in prayer, and then he went to the cross. Even Jesus had that time of worship along with his disciples, lifting up his voice with a hymn. So we see the Bible, just real briefly here, mention different styles. There's different styles in the Psalms. We see Jesus sing a hymn. But is style really the most important factor? The content of a psalm, and, and if you have your Bibles out with you, um, turn with me to John chapter 4, if you will. I know I'm going through a lot of scripture this morning, and I won't always pause 
Um, but turn with me, if you will, to John chapter 4 and find verses 23 and 24. Jesus is speaking to the woman at the well here, and he's going to say something very important. The style of worship is not so much what matters biblically. The, the content is more important. Jesus is going to speak here in John chapter 4 that the heart of the worshiper matters more than the quote-unquote professional quality. Jesus is going to say here that the Father is seeking worshipers who will worship Him in spirit and truth. So in John chapter 4, find verses 23 and 24 with me. It says this, But the hour is coming, and now is, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such to worship Him. God is spirit, and those who worship Him must worship in spirit and truth. What Jesus is saying here is that our worship is not just about passion, nor is it just about truth. It is not just about exuberance, and it's not just about having um, the right things that we're saying in the songs that we sing. Both, Jesus says, are important in spirit and in truth. And it's very interesting to me that Jesus uses worship to explain the gospel to the woman at the well. When he talks about the biblical basis of worship, he uses it to talk about the gospel. Back in seminary, I read a book which I just love, the best book I've ever read on worship. It was called The Great Commission to Worship, and it talked about how worship biblically is meant to fuel the Great Commission. And our worship actually goes full circle. As we focus upon the Lord and we praise His name and our we are worshiping in spirit and in truth with our heart and with our words. It goes full circle and one day those who have been reached with the gospel from every tribe, nation, and tongue will be gathered around the throne worshiping Jesus. The result of the Great Commission is actually worship. Did you know that? In Revelation chapter 7 verses 9 through 12, here's why I'm saying this. The result of the Great Commission will be worship. Our worship propels us to be about the Great Commission, reminds us, re refocuses our hearts and minds, by God's grace refills us with the Holy Spirit and with fire and passion to be about the commission Jesus has given us. And the result of our worship of focusing our eyes upon Jesus is then other people coming to faith and worshiping Him as well. Revelation chapter 7 verses 9 through 12. After these things I looked, and behold, a great multitude, which no one could number, of all the nations, tribes, peoples, and tongues, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes and palm branches in their hands, and crying out with a loud voice, saying, Salvation belongs to our God, who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. And all the angels stood around the throne, and the elders and the four living creatures, and fell on their faces before the throne and worshipped God, saying, Amen. Blessing and glory and wisdom, thanksgiving and honor, power and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen. We see that God has a purpose for worship. So is style really what's most important? No, the, the content's more important. Now I gotta say though, I love so many of the hymns because so many of them are so rich in doctrine and in theology. They remind us so much about what the Bible says. There's one that we even had this morning in, our, in those videos that you could click on and worship along with your family in. One of them that I love so much, it says this. One line of an old hymn says, Prone to wonder, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Take my heart, Lord, take and seal it. Seal it for thy throne above. That hymn expresses the scriptural reality that we are engaged in a spiritual battle. Paul speaks about this later on in the New Testament. Our flesh is warring against our spirit. We are naturally prone to idolatry and backsliding. We see that lesson all throughout the Old Testament in the children of Israel and in the disciples. We need the Lord's help. We need Him to guard our wandering hearts. Our heart, contrary to Disney theology, our heart cannot be followed. It cannot be trusted. Our heart must be yielded to the Lord for his protection. In Jeremiah chapter 17, verses 9 and 10, we learned this. 
it says, The heart is deceitful above all things, and desperately wicked. Who can know it? I, the Lord, search the heart. I test the mind, even to give every man according to his ways, according to the fruit of his doing. The Lord knows us better than we know ourselves. Psalm chapter 139 says, O Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know my sitting down and my rising up. You understand my thoughts afar off. You comprehend my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. The Lord knows you intimately better than you even know yourself. It goes on to say in chapter 139, verses 23 through 24, speaking about yielding our heart to the Lord. Search me, O God, and know me. Know my heart. Try me and know my anxieties. And see if there is any wicked way in me. And lead me in the way everlasting. So on the subject of hymns, there are so many that remind us of rich doctrinal and theological truth. And that doesn't mean that hymns are perfect. There are some in the past that were very doctrinally unsound. But you see, we have the benefit today that many hymns that were modern back in the day and age in which they were written, and they weren't very sound, many of those have passed completely away from common knowledge. We, we don't know about them. Many of them aren't in our hymnal. That doesn't mean that we, we just look at uh, something that's well known and say, well, it must be good because it's old and well established and it's been, been around for a long time. We still have to test whether or not the content is biblical. But we have the benefit that so many hymns, rich and, and rich with meaning and pointing us back to the truth of the Scripture, they have been time-tested and many believers in generations past have been ministered to by them and lift, lifted their voices to the Lord. But I want to go a step further. There's a biblical basis for hymns. Jesus sang a hymn. We saw that. We'll see another place in the New Testament here in a few minutes where hymns were also sung. But what about modern worship? We don't want to address this subject of worship style on the basis of opinion. We want to address it on the basis of Scripture. Well, I will be the first one to say that there are some modern worship songs. There's some contemporary stuff that is very New Agey. There are some songs out there that seem to be more about you than about Christ, that seem to refer to our Lord and Savior more like He's your boyfriend than that he is your master and the one who gave his life for you. There are songs that certainly seem to be more that way today. But not all modern songs are that way. we got to test the content according to the scripture. We want to worship in spirit and in truth, not just passion, but according to the truth of the Bible as well. There are some more modern songs that are very solid. For example, In Christ Alone. We had that one on the list this morning. Another one, Coming Back to the Heart of Worship, a very sound uh, modern worship song. Give Me Clean Hands, I believe that was from the 80s. Uh, another one that we had on that list this morning um, for our worship time. It's pretty new, but it is a edifying modern hymn, His Mercy is More. Very rich, very biblically based. So biblically, we want to approach this issue. Does style matter? Not really. There can be a variety of styles, but our heart to the Lord matters more, whether it's bluegrass or a worship band, whether it's guitar style or piano style or hymn or contemporary. As long as the content is biblical and worship is done in spirit and truth, then that is how the Lord has called us to worship. I, I would add this. We can go to a concert for entertainment, but we come together as the church to worship our Lord and Savior. When we walk into a church, maybe, that we're visiting for the first time, and you hear the worship music, you know what? The style's really not important. What is important, and what I would dare to say, many of us, and many of you that I've gotten to know, I would dare to say this is what you're doing as well. When you visit a church for the first time, or a Christian concert, and I do think this is appropriate, what we should do, our focus should not be on the style. Our focus should be, is this worship that's being done with the right heart? If it is then style is irrelevant. But if the worship is man-centered in a show, that's what's wrong, and that's what has to be addressed. We don't judge on the basis of style, but on content. I've heard somebody say it this way. Every generation has the right to produce their own hymnody. We don't want to forget the rich history of the past, but we also don't want to deny each new generation of Christians the joy of 
of putting their worship into new song to the Lord. For the complete 2,000 years of church history, since the church was established, Christians have been pinning hymns and worship songs to the Lord. And the Old Testament saints were singing scripture far before that. Did you know that the Psalms, which were the original hymn book and prayer book of the Bible, use a lot of very interesting techniques? You see, God has given us the gift of worship. You can even go back and see that there were musicians very early on after Adam and Eve. The Bible takes note of that and talks about how God has given the gift of music to man. Because music helps us to learn things. It helps us to focus our, our heart and mind upon some stuff. Here's a very interesting thing about the book of Psalms. In chapter 119, maybe you know that chapter, the longest psalm, the longest chapter in all the Bible, in Hebrew, the original language in which it was written, it was an acrostic. Acrostic is um, that device of putting something with, with everything having the same first letter. So like praise, prayer, and you go on down a list of biblical truths and everything starts with the letter P. It's an acrostic. In the original Hebrew, Psalms 119 was an acrostic of the 22 letters of the Hebrew alphabet. They have 22 letters, and each one of those letters had an acrostic of things to remember about how important God's word is on the basis of that particular letter of their alphabet. And there were eight verses for each letter. And that is why there are 22 letters, eight verses each, an acrostic of each letter, and there are 176 verses in that psalm. That was inspired by the Holy Spirit, but it used a memory technique inspired by God to help us remember now, it's a little different for us being English speakers. We don't see things the way that the, the original readers of that in Hebrew did. But songs help us to learn scripture and doctrine and theology without even realizing it. It helps us to get God's word and hide it in our heart. Kids remember songs. I remember growing up in church, there are so many bits and pieces of songs, some songs in their entirety that I remember because they were sung and they were to music. It helps us to remember things. At Bates Creek Camp, I remember being down there for several years and helping with, with uh, some of the camp. And we had a song that we would teach to the, the kids and the youth. And it was all about Romans chapter 16, verse 19. And this, this little song put to uh, a, a beat and a rhythm helped kids and youth know this verse of Scripture. And to this day, if you have had kids or grandkids that have gone to Bates Creek, they probably will know if you mention Romans 16, 19. They'll remember that song, and they'll remember what that verse teaches as well. So perhaps the best way I can summarize all of this this morning on this particular thing is which style of worship should we use? Well, Ephesians chapter 5, verse 19. Speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. Biblically, we see there's a variety of style with the right heart. That's the most consistent biblical answer. It's not a magic button to just draw in a crowd. We're worshiping Christ. We're not worshiping in order to gather a crowd around us. We're worshiping our risen Lord and Savior. Our second myth this morning, we won't take as much time on, but that is the myth of benevolence. Benevolence. Now, this is a myth that around the time of the world wars became a very big thing. There was a subtle teaching that began to popularize itself, and it found fertile ground uh, in the wake of the destruction and despair following World War I and II. What this became known as was the social gospel. It, it had to do with misunderstanding what benevolence is meant to be in the Bible. And so let me try to define this. There was an article I found that said it better than I can. And so I'm going to quote this article from gotquestions.org. It's a, a great website that has just uh, simple Christian answers, all footnoted with scripture to a lot of Bible questions and practical questions about the Bible. Uh, and this is how they define the social gospel. And I quote, According to the social gospel, the betterment of society equals salvation. People are basically good as seen by the social gospel. And society is gradually becoming more moral. If we feed enough people, educate enough children, dig enough wells, and redistribute enough wealth, then we will see God's kingdom manifest. If we preach enough love, justice, brotherhood, and goodwill toward men, then the remnants of greed and selfishness in mankind will be overwhelmed and give way to goodness. 
For a Christian perspective on the social gospel, we need to look to Jesus, who lived in one of history's most corrupt and unjust societies. Jesus never issued a call for political change, even though many of his followers yearned for political action. Jesus did not work for social change per se. His mission was spiritual. He came not to wipe out poverty, but to wipe out sin. His cause was not to ensure that all laborers are treated justly, but to justify people before God. Jesus said that poverty would be a continual problem in this world. But money is not the most important thing. We should pursue being rich toward God. Jesus did not come to the earth to be political or a social reformer. He preached the necessity of faith, the need to be born again, and the total reliance on God. His gospel changes people's hearts through the transforming work of the Spirit. And as hearts change, society will change. End quote. What happened in society back around the time of the World Wars with this social gospel is that there were, were people in churches that began to embrace the idea that doing social work was a substitute for the gospel. That if we do enough good things, if we're kind enough and, and do enough social effort, that we will bring God's kingdom to earth in this way. It's not what the Bible teaches. And that quote did a really good job of summarizing that for us. So I, I want to make clear, yes, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, was compassionate, but he also shared the gospel. He knew that just being kind to someone would not save their soul from hell. They had to place their faith in him. They needed to come to him and acknowledge their sinfulness and that he was the only way of salvation. There is many ways in which Jesus shared the gospel. We see that throughout the gospels. And I'm reading a book right now with, with a, a friend of mine called Learning Evangelism from Jesus that, that walks through the gospels and talks about all the many ways that Jesus shared the gospel. There was no one method of evangelism that our Lord and Savior used. He, he used a lot of different kinds. But Jesus always got around to making very clear what the gospel was. So let's briefly seek to understand this morning what is benevolence? What does the Bible say about good deeds and doing good things for our neighbors? In Acts chapter 6, we see that there was a benevolence ministry and, and that was for widows in the church and that's where the first deacons are appointed. Over in 1 Timothy chapter 5, if you would turn here with me, 1 Timothy chapter 5, I, I'd like you to see this for yourself. Based upon this chapter, we're going to see that there was actually a structure that God provides us for benevolence, a, a lens, if you will, through which to understand this. 1 Timothy 5 is going to show us that the primary responsibility for benevolence is the family. The family was intended to be the, the social security, if you will, in God's design. In the event that your family had disowned you because you had become a believer, and you have met the requirements of, of living a life of following the Lord in 1 Timothy 5, Paul goes on to de, uh, provide detailed instructions for taking care of widows who are destitute. Their families have abandoned them. They've been disowned because of their faith, and they're members of the church. This chapter in 1 Timothy 5 is going to provide for us, if you will, a handbook on having a benevolence program or a benevolence ministry as a church. And we're going to see that this was not a social program as much as it was an in-house, if you will, church family ministry. So if you're there in 1 Timothy chapter 5 with me, let's read what Paul says here, this handbook, if you will, on benevolence as a church in 1 Timothy chapter 5, verses 3 through 16. Honor widows who are really widows. But if any widow has children or grandchildren, let them first learn to show piety at home and to repay their parents, for it is good and acceptable before God. Now she who is really a widow and left alone trusts in God and continues in supplications and prayers night and day. But she who lives in pleasure is dead while she lives. And these things command that they may be blameless, but if anyone does not provide for his own, especially for those of his household, he is denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. Verse 9, do not let a widow under 60 years old be taken into the number, and not unless she has been the wife of one man, well reported for good works, if she has brought up children, if she has lodged strangers, if she has washed saints' feet, 
if she has relieved the afflicted, if she has diligently followed every good work. But refuse the younger widows, for when they have begun to grow wanton against Christ, they desire to marry, having condemnation, because they have passed off their first faith. And besides, they learn to be idle, wandering about from house to house, and not only idle, but gossips and busybodies, saying things which they ought not. Therefore I desire that younger widows marry, bear children, manage the house, give no opportunity to the adversary to speak reproachfully. For some have already turned aside after Satan. But if any believing man or woman has widows, let them relieve them, and do not let the church be burdened, that it may, that it may relieve those who are really widows. In this chapter, what we see going on is we see Paul, inspired by the Holy Spirit, very simply and very succinctly cover a whole lot of ground. He shows us that we are called to do good. We are to help those who are truly in need. He's specifically talking about a widow's ministry here amongst church members. But he puts a lot of caveats in there. He says that this is something for those who are truly destitute. This is something for those who, who do not have family. If they have family who are believers, their family need to put their faith into practice and care for their, their grandmother or their mother. That's God's first design so that the church would not be burdened by, by everyone, but by those who are truly without any help, that the church family would come alongside in the place, if you will, of having a biological family fill that role. We also see that Paul talks about that there is an age requirement and that a, a, a godly woman here has, has lived a godly life. She's lived a life of serving the Lord, uh, and, and now she is at a point where she cannot provide for herself, and the, the church has the privilege and the responsibility to care for her. We see that. We also see, though, that Paul says something very interesting. He says that younger widows are not to be cared for. Why? Well, Paul knew what could happen and what did happen. Apparently, uh, what was happening in the church here that he was writing to with Timothy, they had been providing for some younger ladies. And those ladies, some of them, had become busybodies. They were too young, and being provided for uh, was creating an entitlement mentality. So the Bible warns and provides these instructions to show us the way in which we do benevolence is to be wise, is to be, if you will, uh, your own house first, and then your local church family, if you will, second. And we see that there is uh, kind of like a handbook here on how to think through these issues. But the Bible goes on to instruct us about some other things. When we do benevolence, the Bible uh, does not condemn to do charity for, for others who are not members of our family or who are not members of our church. The Bible goes on to say that we can do charity for, for anyone. There's nothing wrong with that. It's biblical. Even a cup of cold water offered in Christ's name can minister to another person. But we are encouraged that when we do charity, we do good deeds and benevolence, we are to practice as much as possible anonymity. It's not to just become a church program. It's something that really, as individual believers and as families, we do for others in a way that other people really don't know about it. In Matthew chapter 6, in Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, here's where we get that. Jesus said this, Take heed that you do not do your charitable deeds before men to be seen by them. Otherwise, you will have no reward from your Father in heaven. Therefore, when you do a charitable deed, do not sound a trumpet before you, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may have glory from men. Assuredly, I say to you, they have the reward. But you, when you do a charitable deed, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, that your charitable deed may be in secret. And your Father who sees in secret will himself reward you openly. We see here the biblical basis for doing things and, and meeting someone else's need as much as possible uh, in anonymity. Now, a practical application of this could be when someone gives, for example, uh, to a specific need or even to something in the church. The principle Jesus encourages us here is in our giving, whether it's an item or food or a bill that's needed or even in our giving to the church, Jesus reminds us that we are not to give in order to be seen. Now, sometimes, to show you ways in which this, this principle has kind of been forgotten in the church world, if we're just going to be honest for a moment, sometimes in a church you'll walk in and you'll find a plaque or something of a fellowship hall or a sanctuary dedicated in somebody's name who was the biggest donor. 
Or sometimes you'll walk into a church building and you'll see a little plaque on the end of pews on someone that donated the money for those pews. Isn't that a violation of what Jesus is saying here? The idea of giving in secret is something that uh, many churches take very seriously. In the Old Testament, and even in the New, we see a biblical basis for even in our regularly, regular tithes and offerings as a church, doing this in a manner which promotes secrecy. Uh, now, a lot of churches, because of COVID, have gone back to this, but it's something we find way back in the Bible, which is the idea of an offering box. There's a reason why a lot of churches, since COVID, have, have stuck with that. They've recognized that the Lord has taken care of the bills. They didn't have to pass the plate. And people were able to give more privately as well. Jesus actually taught us a powerful lesson on giving in the context of an offering box. There was an offering box set outside the temple, I believe it was, and people would go in and they'd drop in their, their different money. And Jesus sits back during a part of the, the gospel accounts. He sits back and he watches people going and giving. And he sees a widow come, and a widow put in her two mites, all that she has as her offering to God. And Jesus teaches his disciples a lesson who are there with him. Do you see what that widow's doing? She has given to the Lord sacrificially, and her offering matters much more than those who are coming in and with great pomp and, and such giving everything. Uh, great sums of money from their abundance in order to be seen by people. I remember growing up in church. This principle of giving was something our, my church growing up understood. And I remember so many times, not every week, we weren't legalistic about it, we didn't always remember, but so many weeks, whoever was going to pray over the offering would say, right before they would, would pray over the offering, they would say, if you are our guest today, do not feel pressured to give. The members of our church give. You're our guests. You're welcome to be with us. Our members give their tithes and offerings to the Lord. And then they would pray, Lord, bless the gift and the giver. And just there was this sense of um, not feeling pressured to give. Sometimes when people walk into our churches, brothers and sisters, sometimes a guest feels pressure when we pass the plate. They feel a pressure to put something in. They feel like people are watching them. I'm not saying that we need to be legalistic about whether we pass a plate or, or, or whether we have an offering box, but it is something important to be thoughtful of. Once again, that principle of just going back to the Bible. What does the Bible tell us about these things that we are doing as a church? There are implications and there are impacts uh, based on how we follow that. So going on on this point on benevolence, Helping others is clearly biblical. Proverbs chapter 19, verse 17. He who has pity on the poor lends to the Lord, and he will pay back what he has given. The Bible does not teach a social gospel, but it does teach that we are to do good deeds, not to grow our church, but out of compassion, being the hands and feet of Christ to other people. As much as possible, anonymously, even in small things like giving a cup of cold water, ministering to others. But this temptation to do good things in order to see people come be part of the church is something that uh, sometimes churches fall prey to. I remember I was consulting with the church once. Their their pastor had, had recently resigned and they were, they were looking for a pastor. And I was chairing their business meetings for several months. And they had a business meeting and the idea came up we need to start a benevolence ministry. We need to start this fund where we start paying people's bills and, and things like that in the community so that we can reach people and get people to come to church. And I remember in that business meeting, I, I turned to 1 Timothy chapter 5, like we just did a few moments ago, and I shared with them that principle in Matthew chapter 6, the principle of anonymity, and said, you know, there's nothing wrong with ministering to others. If you have that burden on your heart, go ahead and do so. But you don't have to do that as an official ministry of the church. You as couples, you as individuals can do that uh, scripturally. But the Bible does not tell us to do good deeds in order to get people to come be part of the church. I've seen that go a very bad way in another instance. There's a church, I know their story quite well. They created a social work ministry, and I, I won't go into the details of what it was, but they created a social work ministry, essentially. And it was a ministry to their community. And it was a great thing, good deeds and great work that they were doing. 
But there was an entire segment of their church body that grew very bitter. Because in their words, that ministry never brings anybody into the church. The Bible never tells us that our good deeds are to get people to come to our church body. Rather, it tells us we do them out of compassion and out of honoring our Savior. I just want to clarify that point as much as I can. Another thing that I want to clarify is that while we are called to do good deeds, we don't do this out of a moralistic focus. The Bible teaches morality about honoring the Lord and living a moral lifestyle. The Bible teaches that, but the Bible does not teach moralism. Moralism is the idea that, that we are just to be good people. And by being good people, we will draw others into the kingdom, we'll encourage society to be better and to, to be a better world just because we're good. That's not what the Bible calls us to. That is exactly, this idea of moralism is exactly the idea that the social gospel taught. The idea of be good and we'll, we'll get people to turn to the Lord just by living good lives. And I fear it's the same thing today that's happening with the, the social justice movement too often. I think there's a lot of good intentions and a lot of, of honest heart desire to help others in that movement today. But I'm afraid that the same mistake is being made of putting social efforts and works in front of the gospel. Moralism is not the teaching of the Bible. You can live a moral life and still never give your life to Jesus Christ. You can be satisfied in your own goodness. You can even feel like you're following the example of Jesus to be compassionate to others and still go to hell because you've never placed your faith in Him for the forgiveness of your sins. Satan does not care if you or I are moral and do good things as long as he can blind us to our sin and our need for Christ. I would say this as well. Jesus healed many people in his ministry throughout the Gospels. Many people who did not turn around and place their faith in him and their trust in him. And I want to let that sit there for just a moment. Even our Lord and Savior reaching out to people in kindness and compassion, so many never turned their faith and trust to Christ. So we do good deeds, but we rest in our faith in Christ. If you would turn with me to James chapter 2. James chapter 2, I think that James here summarizes it probably best of all for us. The Bible clarifies for us this matter of faith and works, our good deeds and our faith. James clarifies this so helpfully for us. James chapter 2, verses 14 through 20. What does it profit, my brethren, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can faith save him? If a brother or sister is naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you says to them, Depart in peace, be warm and filled, but you do not give them the things which are needed for the body, what does it profit? Thus also, faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith, and I have works. Show me your faith without works, and I will show you my faith by my works. You believe that there is one God, you do well. Even the demons believe and tremble. But do you want to know, O foolish man, that faith without works is dead? James clarifies that so well for us. That our faith and our works, they are, they are like two sides of the same coin. They're intertwined together, biblically speaking. Maybe I could say it this way. Our faith in Christ, we're saved by faith alone. We've been talking about that a lot the last several weeks. Our faith in Christ produces fruit. We could say it this way. We're not saved by good works, but we are saved for good works. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 through 10 says this. For by grace, God's gracious gift to you, undeserved, it's His grace. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And that not of yourselves is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus, catch this, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Part of the result of the gospel is that we have been born again, we have been given new life, 
you and I as believers have been created in Jesus to do good works that get this God created beforehand before the foundation of the world there were specific good works that God called me to do and God called you to do he saved us for a reason and a purpose we've not just been saved for ourselves but we've been saved to also be a blessing to others scripture not only provides us these principles in so many places it even shows us the how to instructing us on the methodology of how do we live out these things worship benevolence other stuff we've seen as well in honor and glory to christ so we do good need good deeds in the name of christ not to build our church but to honor the Lord and because he has saved our soul. We do these things regardless of the response. We are doing them unto Christ. If you would turn with me over to uh, Matthew chapter 17, we're going to be there in a couple minutes. We're now going to turn our attention to what is discipleship. And we're going to dive into the Great Commission real briefly this morning. And this is really the point of everything we've been building up to for quite a while now. What is the great co-mission, the mission alongside Jesus that he has called us to be a part of? Jesus called the disciples to follow him, didn't he? If you've read the gospel accounts, he begins by going and saying, come, follow me. And in Luke chapter 6, he prayerfully selects 12 of his disciples. He had many disciples, many following him, but he had 12 that were, were special. It says this in Luke chapter 6. Now it came to pass in those days when he, that's Jesus, went out to the mountain to pray and continued all night in prayer to God. And when it was day, he called his disciples to himself, and from them he chose twelve whom he named apostles. These twelve apostles, these twelve disciples, as we many times refer to them, they did life with Jesus for two and a half to three years. They traveled with him many times. Uh, he sent them out at times too. To, to go do ministry and then report back. He taught them. He answered their questions. He posed questions to them. And he sent these most likely teenage disciples, based on where we believe how old they were. They were most likely teenagers. And he sends these guys out to learn ministry on the job. Jesus did not set up a, a seminary or a Bible college and say, come sit and hear me teach for two or three years. He said, come do ministry with me follow me, do life with me, let's answer questions, let's talk about things. Jesus even pointed out things in their own character at times that weren't, uh, to be honest with you, weren't that good and showed them, hey, you, you need to understand what I say about this. He encourages them to repent. He stops their bickering amongst one another many times, and he sends them, even in the midst of their, their growing in him and their maturing in him, he sends them out to do ministry. And, and to be his hands and feet, and even to preach the gospel. They weren't perfect, they hadn't fully arrived, and they're being sent out to be about sharing the gospel with others. In John chapter 21, before we get to Matthew chapter 17 together, it says this about the disciples, to, to point to the fact of why I'm saying they were most likely teenagers uh, when they were following Christ. John chapter 21, verses 4 through 6. But when the morning had come, Jesus stood on the shore, yet the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. Then Jesus said to them, Children, have you any food? They answered him, No. And he said to them, Cast the net on the right side of the boat, and you will find some. So they cast, and now they were not able to draw it in because of the multitude of fish. Jesus addresses them as, as youngins. He doesn't address them as, as adults there. Here in John chapter 17, if you're there with me, find verses 1 and 2. We're going to look at the three realms of discipleship, the three uh, contexts in which discipleship takes place that we see in the New Testament. There are three different ones. And the first that we see is an accountability group, is what I'll call it. It's an inner circle of three to four people. Here in Matthew chapter 17, Jesus is going to be transfigured before a few of his disciples. This was with his inner circle, the inner three. Now, after six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John, his brother, and Jesus makes four, by themselves up on a high mountain. And he was transfigured before them. His face shone like the shun, uh, sun, and his clothes became as white as the light. There was this inner circle of Peter, James, and John 
who were with Jesus, and he revealed himself in his true form, what he really looked like, on that mountain to them. And, and throughout the New Testament, we kind of learned that this was the inner circle of Jesus. He was really close to these three. It was kind of like an accountability group uh, that he had. They were much closer than, uh, in relationship than the other disciples were. Not that there was preferential treatment, but there was just a closeness amongst this particular group. So there's that very small group of, of two, three, four people. We then see that there is a discipleship group in the New Testament, the second context or second realm of discipleship. And this group is 12 to 15 people because Jesus uh, had the 12 disciples that he was continuing to discuss things with and teach the Bible to. You could say it was kind of like their group Bible study. But at times there were other people than just Jesus. Jesus would make 13 with the 12. But at times Lazarus and sometimes Lazarus' two sisters, Mary and Martha, appear to be part of this group as well at times. And so there's a little bit bigger group than just the 12. But it is this small group that is able to discuss the Bible together. It's small enough that everybody can know each other by name. And they're able to, um, to individually be asking questions and grow in studying the Bible together. And then there is a much larger group that we see in the New Testament, and that is the discipleship that occurs in large gatherings full of corporate worship. And I'll show you where this is in just a, a couple minutes um, in one of the Gospels. But Jesus does refer, the Bible refers to some people that had seen Jesus uh, doing ministry and listened to him and followed him, does refer to some of the people in the crowds as his disciples. So there were the three realms of discipleship, this very close group of two to three people, a very intimate, uh, close friends type group that Jesus had with uh, Peter, James, and John. There was the small group, 12 to 15, of 12, and sometimes some other people. And then there was this large group gathering where there was some discipleship taking place of the crowds that were coming and listening to Jesus teach. But what we see in the New Testament is that no one of these aspects is the only way in which discipleship was to take place. That's the point that I, I want to make here. In Matthew chapter 18, if you're still there in chapter 17, just flip the page or look over to Matthew 18 and verse 20. Sometimes people use this verse to say that their church it's just them and a couple friends that get together, have coffee, and, and pray and talk about the Bible. Um, we certainly see a basis for an accountability group here, but we don't see that this is all that we're being called to. Matthew chapter 18, verse 20, For where two or three are gathered together in my name, I am there in the midst of them. The Bible does tell us that Christ is in our midst when even just two or three of us gather in his name and encourage one another and pray and, and encourage one another in our walk with Christ. But the Bible calls us to more than that. We see that the disciples, the 12 disciples, so many times are having discussions off to the side with Jesus. The crowds are gone or they're in the boat and Jesus is teaching them about the Bible. He's asking them questions. He's even uh, confronting them about their own character with his word and they're having conversations. And this Bible study group, if you will, uh, this small group occurs with the 12 disciples. But the, the disciples were, um, they did not just have church, I guess I'll say it that way, in their Bible study group. Um, they, they had other things they were involved in as well. And I would say this, as important as worship services are that we have corporately on Sunday mornings, it is a Bible study group where you are probably going to grow much more in your walk with Christ. Now the case again we're making right now is that the Bible calls us to all three of these realms of discipleship, not just one. Again, some will say, I have my couple friends and me that talk about the Bible, that's church, I don't need to be part of church. Some will say, well I got my Bible study, I don't need to be part of a larger body because I, I got my Bible study group and that's all I need. It is very important. And if you have a choice of can I attend Bible study this week or worship service, I probably would encourage you to go to Bible study because it's more relational and more, more connection occurs there. For those that, however, say that just attending a service is all the church that I need, all I need to do is attend and hear some preaching, uh, raise my voice, being led in some singing. I don't really need connection to anybody else. I can pop in, sit down, and, and leave after an hour on a Sunday morning. For those that say that's all the church they need, 
I would solemnly remind you what we see in John chapter 6. We see some disciples referred to here that were disciples of Jesus, not the twelve, but disciples uh, in the worship services. And far too often to the present day, what is said of these happens. And a big part of it is because there's not the relational bond that we have in smaller groups. John chapter 6, verses 60 through 61. Therefore many of his disciples, when they heard this, said, This is a hard saying. Who can understand it? When Jesus knew in himself that his disciples complained about this, he said to them, Does this offend you? There are a great number of people that were finally, they had been Jesus' disciples, they've been following uh, in the crowd level, his teaching, his preaching, they were disciples in that sense, but they were finally beginning to understand that this isn't just all good stuff, there, there are some hard things. Jesus is calling us to surrender our lives not just receive the multiplied loaves, which is what happened in John chapter 6 in context. Jesus had multiplied the loaves and fishes, and there were people that wanted another miracle. They wanted more good stuff. They were seeking out Jesus to do the miraculous again, but they didn't really want to surrender to him. And as Jesus begins to explain, you got to have me. you, you got to have me to be the bread of your spiritual life, not just miraculously more bread in your belly. And they are not liking this. It goes on to say in verse 64, Jesus says, But there are some of you who do not believe. For Jesus knew from the beginning they were who did not believe and who would betray him. It goes on to say in verses 66 through 69, From that time, many of his disciples that were amongst the crowd following his teaching, many of his disciples went back and walked with him no more. Then Jesus said to the twelve, Do you also want to go away? Notice here, the twelve personally know Jesus. There's a connection to him that is deeper than the crowds just hearing Jesus' teaching. Jesus said to the twelve, Do you also want to go away? But Simon Peter answered, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Also, we have come to believe and know that you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. So there are these three realms of discipleship. The three or four small group, the accountability group, if you will. There's the Bible study group, the 12 to 15. There's the corporate worship of a larger gathering. All are important to our spiritual growth. But we want to ask the question now, going a little bit deeper, these are the ways in which discipleship takes place in the gospel and the way, I would dare say, that we still need um, to be following Christ as disciples today. You need a couple people that hold you accountable in your Christian walk. I got a couple of guys that we, we hold each other accountable. We pray for one another. We touch base every now and then. I have another group where we study the Bible together. It's a Bible study. And then another group where I'm able to sit and to hear the preaching and the teaching of the Word of God and be ministered to that way. In my own walk with Christ, I don't need just one. I need all three. All of us need that, and the Bible teaches us that. But let's go a little bit deeper. Those are the ways in which practically discipleship takes place, the context, the realms, we could say, the, the relational context. But what is discipleship? Turn with me, if you will, to Matthew chapter 28. Matthew chapter 28. What is discipleship? Our Lord's method of discipleship is more organic and relational than programmatic and information impartation. And I know that's a very wordy thing. But Jesus was more focused on having a relationship and helping his disciples, that inner group, walk with him. It was more of a personal relational thing than it was of a program or a seminar of sitting down and I'm going to give you a bunch of info. There's a time and a place for learning more facts and, and truths about the Bible. But discipleship is much more than just sitting in a classroom. We never arrive in our discipleship. It's not something that we ever really complete the process of. We see that with the 12 disciples. They were never done growing. Even after Jesus ascended into heaven, they still had to meet for prayer and studying the Bible and seeking the Holy Spirit in their walk with Christ. It's, it's a starting point. We never fully arrive in our discipleship. It's not a class. It's not a program. It's not an event. It's a lifelong journey. You and I are not disciples because we have placed our faith and trust in Christ. We're disciples if we follow Jesus. Jesus told his disciples, follow me, follow me. 
And following Christ does not mean uh, Facebook following. We can like a page. We can be a Facebook fan. Jesus is not after fans. He's not after people that are just interested in some of the stuff he has to say. When he talks about being after disciples, he's talking about someone being a true follower. Now, I'm going to use this illustration, and I'm, I'm not this, but if I was to say this, you would know exactly what I meant. If I was to say that I was a disciple of Hitler, you would know exactly what that meant. When we say we're a disciple of someone, it means to follow their example, to devote yourself to their teaching, to sit at their feet, so to speak, to adopt their mission. In Matthew chapter 28, if you're there with me, find verse 16. Jesus is going to give the great co-mission, the mission that his disciples were to have alongside him, alongside the risen Christ. Jesus is still about his mission in the world through us and through the Holy Spirit the ministry of the Holy Spirit, and we are to be co-missioned alongside him, partnered alongside him. So in Matthew 28, let's first of all look at verses 16 through 17. Then the eleven disciples went away into Galilee, to the mountain which Jesus had appointed for them, and when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Now I want to stop right there. These verses come right before the most famous verses that we usually refer to as the Great Commission. But notice verse 17. When the disciples see him, the risen Jesus, they worship him. We've talked about worship. We've talked about getting our eyes focused on Jesus. But notice what they do exactly after that. Some doubted. Right before Jesus gives the Great Commission to his disciples, these 11 that are left, Judas is, is now gone. They are doubting whether or not Jesus' method is going to work. And I would dare to say this is exactly the same way many of us, uh, many people today, and many of us in the church can be prone to approach discipleship. Why have we talked about some myths of church growth and myths of discipleship, uh, of adopting mentalities that are not what the Bible teaches, these gimmicks that are going to get us off track and not please the Lord and not be as the Bible instructs us? Why have we talked about that? Because to this present day, people still doubt that Jesus' method of discipleship is really going to work. It seems too simple. It, it seems too easy in a sense, and yet it also seems too hard. People want to improve upon what God has told us to do, what Christ has given us to do. But we can't improve upon it. The Lord has created the, the right design. We just must submit and obey Him. So we see they behold Christ, they focus on Christ, they worship Him, and yet they're having this push and pull within themselves to doubt and to embrace some other method. Even after, uh, even after Peter had seen Jesus risen from the dead, he went back to fishing. Jesus has to go hunt him down and say, Peter, what are you doing? You're not doing what I've called you to do. He has to go back to the Apostle Peter, who had gone back, gone back to his old life, even after he had seen the risen Jesus. Because Jesus spent 40 days walking around and visiting with the disciples and his followers before he ascended into heaven. And Jesus had to bring back even Peter, who had seen the risen Christ and was doubting. In Matthew chapter 28, go on to 18 through 20, the verses that are most well known as the Great Commission. And Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to observe all the things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Jesus says a lot in these few verses. He first of all begins with, All authority is mine. All authority is Christ's. He has the authority to instruct us what to do. He's the one who is seated upon the throne. He rules and he reigns. We trust him and we submit to him. We see then that the Bible talks about, Go ye. Go ye therefore. You're, you're going on a purpose. You're not just, um, you're, you're going on a mission. And there is an emphasis, particularly in the Great Commission here, that you're going, doing something specifically. You're making disciples. You're doing this to every ethnic, every nation, every ethnic group, crossing every divide with the gospel. You're baptizing as a public sign of those who have placed their faith and trust in Jesus. We've talked about that a lot the last several weeks. We take that first step of obedience, of making a decision to follow Christ. But I want you to look very closely 
at verse, <clears throat> uh, let's see, I believe it's number 19 there. Look at that verse very closely with me yet again. In verse 19, it begins with, Go therefore. I want you to think through a point with me for a moment. The Great Commission began with Jesus' authority. And in verse 19, there's still a lot more that comes after that. The Great Commission does not end with the word go. Now, I'm going somewhere with this. Jesus shows us that the Great Commission is many times slow work. It's not just going and preaching the gospel and checking the box We've been about Great Commission work because we've shared the gospel with somebody. That is part of it. But discipleship and evangelism are like two sides of the same coin. They are intertwined and so deeply connected. But the Great Commission is not just discipleship, and it's not just evangelism. It's both. Evangelism, I also would go on to say, is not a spiritual gift. Sometimes, the enemy is really good at tempting us that, well, other people are, have the gift of evangelism. You don't or I don't. And the enemy uses that to deceive us not to be about the Great Commission. Brothers and sisters, evangelism is not a spiritual gift in the Bible. It's not. Paul told Timothy, who was called to be a pastor, to fulfill his calling and do the work of an evangelist. In Ephesians chapter 4, it talks about five different ministry leadership roles that God has given to the church. But those are offices. They are leadership roles. They are not spiritual gifts. There is the office of an evangelist in the New Testament to be an equipper, but it is not a spiritual gift that makes someone better in sharing the gospel. Let me kind of illustrate that for you. Billy Graham we probably can look to. We understand God used him mightily in the work of evangelism. Billy Graham was in the office of evangelist, the, the leadership role in the body of Christ as an evangelist. But Billy Graham was not really um, one who possessed some type of spiritual uh, anointing to be a great evangelist. Billy would tell you, if you talk to him, that he had, and you can read his biographies and things, he had an enormous team of prayer partners behind him. And before Billy Graham would ever come to do a crusade or anything, he had an entire team that would go months in advance to mobilize the local churches. Local churches would be praying, would be inviting people, would be having a plan in place on how they're going to connect with those who, who make the decision to follow Christ on that night when Billy would come and preach. They had a plan and a strategy in place. Billy Graham was in the office, the leadership role of being an evangelist, but his role, as Ephesians chapter 4 says, and we're going to get into that in a couple of weeks in much more detail, Billy's role was simply to be in that evangelist role to equip the saints to do the work of the ministry. He didn't do it all himself. He had a massive prayer team behind him. He had a massive team of other believers laboring alongside him in inviting people and sharing the gospel of people and counseling people that would walk the aisle that night. All of those things, many other people were involved. And just like with Spurgeon, many decades before, who was also uh, many times applauded as being mightily used by the Lord in his preaching, Spurgeon also would tell you it wasn't about him. He had a massive group of people in his church that continued to pray for him and pray for the lost in their worship services. Both Billy Graham and Spurgeon, used mightily evangelistically, were used of the Lord but they were used to mobilize and encourage God's people, believers, to be about the work of evangelism and sharing the gospel. It wasn't about their personality. It was about a massive partnership of the body of Christ. And so the Lord does raise up individuals who are, are to that leadership role of an evangelist in order to encourage and help uh, light the fire in all of us for evangelism. But it is not a spiritual gift. Therefore, evangelism is a duty of every believer. It's a responsibility of every believer. It's not something that we have to be gifted in. And I know evangelism is intimidating. It's still intimidating 
at, at times to me. I got all my excuses. I'm naturally more introverted. Small talk's hard for me. Deep conversations are more easy. Trust me, I know what it's like if, if that's uh, how you feel. I have my sinful excuses like anyone else. But it comes down to a matter of obedience. Am I sharing the gospel with people? Am I making disciples? Because that's what Christ has called me to do. I may feel nervous. I may not feel especially good at it. But I can tell you that if you will do it afraid and be obedient to the Lord, He will open doors. In the marketplace, I've had conversations with coworkers, And I, I don't tell them I'm a preacher. I try to avoid having that conversation because then they, they will treat you differently. But when the, the question will come up, why, why aren't you living this way? Why aren't you doing some of these things that the rest of, of uh, the, the guys from work or whatever are doing? I use it as an opportunity to say, I'm a Christian. And the reason why I don't do that is because I want to honor my Savior. And I have an opportunity to then go a step further and say, the gospel is not just about being a good person. It's about Jesus who has saved me from my sin. And in 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 15, I, I many times personally take this gospel approach when I'm sharing it with a co-worker. Not always, but this is a way that I've tried many times. They notice my life is different, and so I try to use that as an opportunity to talk about, I, I try to live differently because I want to honor Christ and He saved me. And then I want to be very clear about what the gospel is. I don't want them... Uh, to feel that I am just trying to be a good person or that I feel I'm better than them because I go to church or I read my Bible or anything like that. I want to show them that the gospel is about God's grace. And so I go back to 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 15, um, and I, I seek to explain the gospel this way. Paul said this to Timothy, This is a faithful saying worthy of all acceptance, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the chief. Paul says that this is this is a saying, this is a mantra that should be completely accepted. It should be something the church knows that Jesus came to save sinners. Amen? And I'm the worst one. Another translation renders this verse this way. This is a saying trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, and I am the worst of them. When I have the opportunity to start sharing with a co-worker the gospel, see I'm different, I point to the fact I want to honor my Savior, and I say, and here's the thing, Jesus has saved me, and if He can save me, He can save you. It's not a condemning attitude. It's not saying that I'm somehow better than you because I go to church or because I read my Bible. It's to say the gospel is about Jesus extending His mercy to us and dying in our place, and I'm just as bad a sinner. I'm worse than a sinner than you are. The Bible pictures for us that we must have this view of ourselves, that I am the chief, I am the worst. Do you have that view of yourself? If you do, it will change the way that you approach sharing the gospel with other people. Paul was able to say in the book of Romans, I wish that I could be accursed. Paul said, I wish I could go to hell and that my people, the Jewish people, could be saved. Do we have that level of love? Jesus shares a parable in the gospel accounts where he talks about a, a tax collector who was the scum of the earth back in his days and a Pharisee. And as the story goes that Jesus shares, the Pharisee comes and prays in a public place and loudly says, thank you, God, I'm not like this tax collector. Thank you, I do all these good deeds and I'm not a sinner and all this stuff. Thank you, God. Very arrogant, very hypocritical. And the tax collector comes before God and in their, his prayer, he bows himself to the ground. He won't even lift his eyes up to heaven, and he says, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. And Jesus says, of the two, which do you believe went home justified? Which one went home forgiven that day after they prayed to God? Our heart in evangelism matters. The main task of the Great Commission, though, is not just sharing the gospel. That's the starting place. The main task of the Great Commission in that passage, if you've still got your Bible open, is what we see in verse 20. It doesn't end with the word go. The emphasis is on making disciples. And the main task is teaching to observe all that Jesus has commanded. And that word observe means obedience, teaching obedience. Parents and grandparents watching, you know what it's like to teach a child to obey. It's not easy. It takes time. It takes effort. But this is what discipleship is about. 
helping another person grow in their obedience and their walk with Christ. It's not just a, a six-part series. It's not just a, a two-year Bible study. All those things can be helpful. But discipleship is not fundamentally a program or an event or a class. It is fundamentally about a relationship and growing in our obedience to Christ and following Him. So there is once again a difference here when it's talking about teaching. There's a difference between the office of a teacher, somebody spiritually gifted to teach, and teacher as a mentor. Not every believer is gifted to teach, but every believer is called to teach in the context of making disciples. So we see that we are teaching for obedience, and discipleship is helping to teach for obedience, which means that we are... Um, Helping someone else be devoted in their walk with Christ and grow in their personal walk with Christ. It's, it's the idea, maybe I could say it this way, of mentorship. You may not have the gift of teaching and so you feel you can't make disciples. Many don't have that spiritual gift. God does not give that gift to everyone. The Bible is clear about that. But just like a parent, even if you are not the best teacher, you can mentor your kid. You, you can teach as a mentor someone else. In the workplace, you may not be in the training department, you may not be a teacher per se in the professional world, but you can mentor another employee. You can encourage someone else in their walk with Christ. And as we saw last week in Titus chapter 2, the Bible instructs us for men to do that with men and women to do that with women. Biblical discipleship is transformational. It changes our heart. It's heart work of God working within us and changing us from the inside out, not the outside in. Legalism is trying to change the external things before the heart has changed. The idea of look this way, be this way, this is what you must do, that's legalism. I'm not saying that there's no standards biblically, but the Bible shows us that the gospel is about your heart first. Jesus saves us. We're born again inside. We are spiritually reborn, and then it begins to change. The witness and ministry of the Holy Spirit changes us outside. The gospel works from the inside out. Legalism works from the outside in. We need to keep that in mind as we are, are doing discipleship. And discipleship, lastly, is character forming. We continue to be conformed to the image of Christ. We go from glory to glory looking more and more like our Savior. I know we've gone for a while this morning. Let's begin to wind down. 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 14 and 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 4, 14 through 15. Paul is writing to the Corinthians and he says this, kind of wraps it up for us. I do not write these things to shame you, but as my beloved children, I warn you. For though you might have 10,000 instructors in Christ, yet you do not have many fathers. For in Christ Jesus I have begotten you through the gospel. Paul talks about how there's a lot of people teaching the Bible, and, and that's good, that's not all bad. But Paul says that you don't have very many fathers. You don't have someone who has spiritually begotten you, mentored you, encouraged you in the gospel. But that that matters. Back in the very beginning of the Bible, when God created Adam and Eve, we see that God gives the dominion mandate that Adam and Eve are to rule over creation and they're to fill the earth. They're to have a family. They're to reproduce and have a family and fill the earth and subdue it. And in the Great Commission, it's very interesting that the same type of thing is given. Jesus now calls every one of his believers to spiritually reproduce, to make a disciple. This is what the Great Commission is. Each one for each one is the way some people have said it. It's the idea of reproducing disciples. We're a disciple of Jesus. We're following him. We're seeking him. We're growing in our own walk. It's a lifelong discipleship journey with Christ, and we're helping others along that journey as well. And it's an idea of a multiplying effect. It's, well, I'll get to that in a moment. Paul, even though he was single, he get many people through the gospel. He made many disciples. So as we wind down this morning and we wrap up, ask yourself these questions. First of all, are you a disciple of Jesus? Are you following Christ? Are you continuing that journey in your walk with Christ to grow in serving Him and obeying Him and following Him? Secondly, 
Are you making disciples for Jesus? Are you about the Great Commission? Are you encouraging someone else in their walk with the Lord? And if this morning you find that you are not, if you find that you're not a disciple at all, would you say, Lord, forgive me of my sin and help me to follow you today. Help me to obey you. Thank you for dying on that cross for me in my place. I want to honor you and surrender my life to follow you each and every day. Is that you this morning? Or maybe you're a believer watching this. And maybe you'd say, I I already believe in Christ, but to be honest, I'm not discipling anybody. If that's you this morning, a believer, and you're not discipling anyone, would you pray this? I'd I'd encourage you, would you pray this? Would Would you pray, Lord, here I am. Say it in your own words. Lord, here I am. Give me someone to pour into. Help me to to be able to help somebody else grow in their walk with Christ. Would you pray that? The last thing I want to share with you today is our what we normally would call our benediction. In Acts chapter 8, we read this about the church right after Stephen is martyred for his faith. Now Saul was consenting to his death. At that time, a great persecution arose against the church, which was at Jerusalem. And they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. Persecution arises after Stephen is martyred, and the believers start going everywhere. The disciples start going everywhere. But the apostles remain there. The twelve, well, the eleven now, stay there. And then in verse 4 it says this, Therefore, those who were scattered went everywhere preaching the word. You're going to hear me talk more about this in the weeks ahead. But the greatest harvest, when God touches his church and brings revival, the greatest harvest of souls does not come through the ministry of the pastor. The greatest harvest comes through the mobilized church body. Acts 8 made it very clear the apostles are back in Jerusalem. But the church is scattered. God sovereignly used the persecution which scattered them. And they went everywhere. Not the apostles, but the church members went everywhere preaching the gospel. And many people were saved. Father, we thank you this morning. We thank you for the opportunity. Even though, Lord, a a video is not the same as fellowship in person, we still thank you for this opportunity. Father, I pray for this video for those who are watching who may not who may not regularly be part of our, our church worship. Father, I just pray that you would minister to them. For those who may watch this replay as it is shared by church members or shared by others, I pray, Father, that you by your Spirit would minister to people, that they would see and hear the parts or the part that they need to be ministered to where they are today. Father, we thank you that you are always with us. We thank you for the great commission you've given, Father. This beautiful thing, it's It's not easy. It's this beautiful thing, though, Father, where we can be about the Great Commission with you. Father, help us when we are afraid of sharing our faith. Father, help us to share our faith afraid. Father, get our heart in the right place. Light us on fire by your Spirit. And Father, help us to understand what discipleship is. And in the future, Lord willing, help us to continue to dive into what you are calling us to be about as a church. Father, help us in everything we say and do, everything we design as the ministries of our church, to have that lens of the Great Commission of understanding how are we sharing Christ and how are we inviting people into contexts where they can grow in their walk with Jesus, where we can be about the mission, the mission alongside you, Lord, that you have called us to be in of making disciples. Help us to be about that work until you come. It is in your name that we pray, and we thank you so much. Amen. Amen. As we close this video this morning, you can go to the description of this video, and I'd encourage you, there's, a, there's another song there, like we did for our worship moment. Uh, there's a song, you can click on the link. I'd encourage you to take the time to listen to that. Uh, sing along with it if you'd like. And then just take a couple minutes to pray. Close in prayer personally. Uh, pray together if you're with family today. And uh, may you enjoy the rest of your Sunday. May God bless you. Um, If you're going out to spend time with family today, 
Um, may God protect you on the roads, and Lord willing, we'll see you all next week. God bless.